Welcome back, everyone, to the 2015 Mid-Season Invitational taking place on the campus of Florida State University. Shocks posing with some fans, as you see. Oh, nice little peace sign out there. People having a great time today. We have ourselves a Series 1-1. And it's an exciting one at that. We're going to take another look at a viewing party happening today. Here are the fans in Dallas, Texas, where everything is bigger, even the league action, gentlemen. Hey, that's where you're from. <laughs> that's a common misconception, and that is not where I'm from. Not that that's a bad place to be from. Now, throughout MSI, we've been celebrating the 2014 League of Legends World Champions with the release of the Samsung White commemorative skins. And today, we're taking a closer look at the final two skins that make up the bottom lane. These skins immortalize both Mata's heat-seeking thresh hooks and Imp's smile and deadly laugh that struck fear in the hearts of their opponents. <laughs> 2014 but turning back to the matchup at hand, SK Telecom and EDG are tied at 1-1 going into game three. SKT are leaving Easy Hoon in in the mid lane for this third game. Yeah, I think a lot of this is just the different play styles from the team because game one, you saw SKT up against EDG making EDG play SKT style. The slow, they got ahead early and they were like, all right, late game is where we're going to bring this out to. EDG is not going to have that hectic early game. Game two, EDG, immediate invade, blind invade, go into the brush, get a fight, and that's the EDG style. And they made SKT play a very frantic, chaotic game where they thrive. Yeah, and this is where I got to kind of disagree with Monte Cristo on the uh, mid lane matchup here because they sent Myron into Pawn's lane, sent him out of lane, so that equalized the lane in my eyes because they were pretty much equal in kills. And what's Pawn's response to that? He doesn't sit middle and farm. He goes and dives Myron, flashes over the wall, gets a kill, recalls, then goes and gets a dragon for his team as well. Mid Mid lane isn't this vacuum utopian society where it's 1v1. Like, killing creeps will only get you so far in this game. Well, matchups aside, though, in every best of five and even best of threes, tendencies come out. And that's why it's a whole nother monster than best of ones. And the one that, the one pick that has really stu stood out for me has been the Annie. Both teams have really prioritized this pick. And what does Annie bring to the table that these other supports don't have? Well, she has a guaranteed high damage engaged that just other champions do not pack. The Alistar was one that was banned out game one, but it's still not quite the same thing as Annie, as well as having a really dominant laning phase with the opportunity of going for a really strong 2v1 and invade. I think this pick is going to be either first picked in one of these games, whether it's the purple side or the other one, or banned. I cannot believe it did not come out before this. Mako played more Annie games during the season than anything else. He had 14, next highest Thresh on 12, and it was a staple in the bands against him. He's so good on it. Couple that with Wolf's tendency to overextend for vision. I think that it's just such a brilliant pick to bring into the series at this point. Yeah, and if you look at the lane, just during the laning phase, it's the only one of those hard engaged champions in team fights that actually has harass pressure without going all in during the lane. Another cool thing about Annie, though, is the fact that unlike Sejuani, where Sejuani pretty much forces a mid laner to take cleanse, the mid laner cannot afford to take cleanse against somebody who isn't even thinking about going to the lane. But when you start grouping up, she's wishing, the mid laners are wishing that they took cleanse against the champion. Well, a lot of action so far in this series as we head back to Rivington, Jat, and Deficio. Clear Love isn't putting much thought into his team's loss to SKT in the group stage and thinks that in a best of five, EDG has a strategic edge. <laughs> 因为输给SKT来场是BO1嘛 We've also heard previously from Clearlove in interviews that this tournament would allow them to really make adequate adjustments to things they need to make with the team few things hit them coming up in the patches, but it seems like they've righted all those wrongs. And yeah. now facing SKT in the finals, we got game three. He's got a game three here. Last game, you can't really expect to get three kills on level one again from EDG, <laughs> but they showed how they could keep control of the objectives. SK Telecom did what they could to get back in the game. Now, new pick and ban phase. SKT is back on blue side. 
Last time, we saw them ban the likes of LeBanc. Probably gonna do the same. Thing is, Hecarim as well. Every single time EDG has faced SKT in this tournament, I feel like their pick and ban phase has improved. Group stage, Edward Gaming got crushed. Game one, I think they split, and I think last game, Edward Gaming was able to come out on top with a bit of a surprise and read on yeah. SK Telecom. Now's the chance for SKT to kind of bounce back in the pick and ban. That's the thing. We talked about how SKT's combo in the last game was just so hard to pull off, because if you didn't get to the carries with Wolf and his ulti on Leona, you couldn't simply take them down. And that didn't work for him. One of the big reasons we saw Wolf had, what was it, eight deaths last game? Also seeing Easy Hoon then try to just pick up the Orianna was also different, not something we thought would have come out of Champion Select. Let's get to the bands now for game three, guys. We're already almost to Edward Gaming's final ban. So SKT here trying to put Edward Gaming in a bit of a dilemma here. Do you want to now ban Rek'Sai? Do you want to ban Urgot instead? Whichever is an option for us to first pick. Azir as well is open, and with Cassiopeia being banned away, that is a legit early pick that you can take for someone like Isihun in the mid lane. So I feel like there are a few good options for them. Rek'Sai would be the one we would expect if we look before the series even started for Pinky here. He, again, it's the number one jungle pick for him. But now they can control the Maokai. I mean, it's not to be understated how effective Coral was on Maokai. It was 6, 1, and 20 in that last game super hyper tank and they can combo the things that they won with last game they're putting the emphasis on SKT to then adapt to what EDG just did last game. Seeing as Easy who mainly plays these big team fighting mages that sits back not all in champions running so much engage especially guaranteed lockdown with with the Maokai and then even a flash table spawn and Annie is gonna make it very tough for Easy Hoon in the fight because you know he's gonna sit back there, you know he's gonna be open for these engages. So Edward Gaming is really drafting against Easy Hoon very much. If SKT goes with this, it's something they played a lot of over in the LCK. It's their mid-game dragon-focused move speed composition that gets picks. They yeah. have been very successful running this team composition. They have. It is a comp though that really requires them to control the early to mid game. Because once you go late game, now that you're also running Rek'Sai, not a Nunu to buff up this AD carry, right. your main damage source is the Sivir. And Maokai is just so good at itemizing against that AD carry and sit in front of him. Sijuani can come in for clear love as well and you still have this double massive front line for Edward Gaming. can even run Nunu if they want themselves with the Jinx. So SK Telecom are really looking to get early dragons and close out this game. We're talking 35 right. minutes at max 40 for them. Otherwise, they're really going to run out of damage compared to what EDG is going to be building up here. I was going to say, he blind pick a Cassidy for himself. Is the new to the lock-in? Huge upgrade for Jinx there with the Blood Boil as well. They could be crushing down turrets if they get the right map positioning. And EDG shows quite the composition already. Final pick for Pawn here after SKT finalizes. And there are a few reasons for this Nunu pick for, for EDG. One, of course, you buff up the Jinx. That's fantastic. You can even go with Zia as a last pick, who also benefits from the Blood Boil. But the vision control Nunu brings against a composition that has to create picks by catching you out is so, so big for EDG. And the fact that we're going to be seeing a lot of Dragon contests this game. That's the way that SK Telecom is going to try and snowball this one. I really wonder here what Marn is going to use as his top lane pick. He is not a Lulu player. That is a mid lane Lulu for Easy Hoon. 99% chance right here. And normally SK Telecom wants to run this with a Maokai because it creates picks and can be that big tank lane. A rumble here does completely change the complexion of this team comp. The thing is, they feel like they need more damage in their comp, because they're against double tank, because they only have a Sivir with a Lulu buff. The problem is, once again, you run with a single tank, that's the Rek'Sai, against a Jinx and Azir, which is what I would guess at least would oh, be, be the no. pick also with the Nuno earlier being locked in. So there's so much damage from EDG in the back line that Rek'Sai won't do anything on his own. And SK Telecom, once again, they rely on mid-game picks and fights around the Dragon. If EDG can keep wards down to it, spot where SKT is coming from and not be caught out and just play somewhat passive honestly, get to two items on a Z and Jinx, they're yeah. gonna be more than fine. The team fight potential with the double tank and then the double damage dealers of epic proportions there in Azir and Jinx is a tremendous team fight composition. Then you look at SKT, they have won with this before. 
Yes. Save for the Rumble right here. Mm -hmm. Another incredibly fascinating pick in ban phase right here because you can tell that SK Telecom has a strategy in mind and Edward Gaming keeps throwing some kind of wrench into it and breaking it up a little bit. Seeing as EDG has struggled around Dragons in the past and that they tend right. to be caught out if they try and go and clear vision, I can definitely see why SKT want to draft this comp here and say, we're going to see if you have learned anything. We're going to see if we can keep catching you out because we know you tend to play a bit too far forward when it comes to fighting around the map. And that's what they're building for completely. Well, we've seen one game go the way of SKT completely in their favor. EDG made SKT walk to the beat of their drum in game two. A lot of people on social media for that game were wondering why EDG didn't close it out faster. I think they just gate themselves with Barons and then they win the game. It's obviously their prerequisite. You see the coaches shaking hands here as we get ready to enter into game three. You know the drill is well at home and here at the arena at LOL Esports with either hashtag SKT win or hashtag EDG win. We'll be counting up those votes and sharing the results shortly. As Grandpappy Riv the first would always say, we are on the rift. <laughs> right on. Where are you guys? Where you, where'd you go? <laughs> We're gonna start Goodbye, this one day. off. Let's see what they got for each other. SKT walked themselves into a pretty bad fight last time as EDG was able to meander through the top side of the jungle, get themselves into great positioning. Yeah, the strangest thing about the last invade was that EDG was spotted out completely by a ward and then SKT decided to go in again. That was also a slightly different lane matchup where Deft didn't necessarily want to be in a 2v2 lane. Jinx and Sivir have an interesting 2v2 matchup here that they're willing to lane against because of the dragon emphasis in this game. Right, so yeah, a few things for, for SKT here. First of all, Ruby Crystal for Marin in the top lane. That's what you do if you expect a one-on-one -on -one against Maokai and you want a very early haunting, guys, when you go back so you can once again yep. start fighting around these early dragons and you can become a bit of a bully in that lane with early magic penetration. At the same time, as you just said here, you want to keep your bottom lane on the bottom side of the map so you have that control around it. What they normally do with Lulu mid is they try and push the wave as often as possible and then you have Easy Hoon who can whimsy himself to start roaming between the lanes and start catching up people with Bengi on this Rexa here and that's how you start creating picks already from the laning phase. And it's actually EDG going with a lane swap here. I wonder whether or not Clearlove can do enough to contain Bengi in the roam game. That was a late swap back right there for EDG. They showed the defensive lines in the normal place, realized there weren't going to be any lane scouting wards, safely recalled, and then they have come back here. This is going to be uh, revealed as soon as the lane swap happens, but outside of that, SKT is expecting normal lanes right now. You guys are saying very safe with that line of scrimmage in wards right along the river. Now with SKT getting that knowledge at the top lane, I believe they did just see Deft walk out. So because there's no Same. wards for SKT to try and spot what's happening at yeah. level 1 and they were most likely expecting standard lanes, they're not sending in Wolf to check the blue buff of EDG, which means Clearlove has been able to start on the weak side. That means the opposite side of where your dual lane is going and get the blue buff so they don't risk Wolf suddenly walking in, start harassing them and trying to poke them away and completely take over the bottom side of the map. And what EDG has done before as well is then they place early wards and try and get a Rift Scuttler near this dragon to see if anything is happening. Bengi didn't get it. So, Clearlock has managed to get some control on the bottom side of the map. Got the blue buff as well. You can see Bengi moving there because for him to go his own blue buff can be risky now, seeing as there are two members on the right. top side from EDG that can go down and try and stop him. It was just that entire guessing game that EDG was able to win right there. You expect with the defensive line wards and the Annie Jinx being a pretty good lane 2v2 up against Sivir Thrash to go for that lane swap. It's a strategic move that mainly has the element of surprise, but surprise they did, and now they have a real chance of 3-buffing Bengi. Also have a real chance of getting some of those early kills oh, they're they stopping. love. They have the wolf spirit, however, and they are seeing. This Looks is dangerous. Like going to get a little bit of pressure from Bangi. Smite fight coming out both. Actually, Bengi's is down here from that Wolf Spirit, as we just saw. So, not really a smite fight, but still going to try and pressure their boss. That Ignite is pulled out of some kill pressure from Mako's lane. 
flashes, however, are being burned, and SKT are again finding themselves quite down in the beginning of the fight. Pony Whoa. and Easy Hoon going 1v1 here as we just kind of waltz over to the right, and they both have to flash. No, one summoner spell, sorry, on Pawn's side. Easy Hoon has to flash. I very much disagree with Koro teleporting into this blue buff here. He had a free lane in the bottom lane, one on one against the Sivir. Same level, you can see the wave down here is even, huh? and he'd already picked up 11 CS. Sitting there nicely, he joins in to push them away and try and get a first blood. Let's see what happens now though, because he needs to get something, otherwise he's lost a lot from teleporting out of this lane. Yeah, they already had the teleport bird from the rumble, and now everyone's deciding to party up here. Nobody cares about the bottom lane. All right, we're going to see who can come out of this one better now. It's pretty much making those adaptations mid-game here. We're only five minutes in, and we really don't even have lanes just yet. Koro and Pawn still in the mid lane now as he's low on mana. They need to stop these from going right into the turret. Bang is going to try to make that happen immediately, though. And what pressure here coming in from SKT after that jungle invade from EDG. SKT needs to send someone bottom lane because... Immediately. There's what, a three-wave stack down there. Yeah, what Bang did was the wave was pushing towards him and he just left it there and roamed to the mid lane because he wanted to see if he could join for some of the action. This also means Koro is losing out on so much fine because all these minions have killed a few waves. Now Bang will return down. I think he only lost maybe one or two of the melee ones, so he's going to get most of it and a oh. cannon as well. So he will lose some of the farm. But the main thing for him is because Koro teleported away from this lane, he's not been getting a bigger lead over Marin, who was stuck up here right. in the 1v2. Early on, he now has help from the Thresh, and he can start picking up some farm. EDG putting so much value on a simple blue buff. Great job. Pretty much all around. Richard Bang would be down in CS. He picked up enough and still equaled out to death farming in the top lane. Still just about even in gold as well, so really a lot of summoners and a whole hoopla for the early part of that game. Yeah. Not to get too much. It ends up it ends up being kind of even, although yes. EDG had the opportunity to pull an experience advantage, they just would have had to give the blue buff over, which would allow Bengi maybe some control over that side of the map. Mm -hmm. but, but even so, I'm completely on Deficio side right here. Coral could be so far ahead in this game right now, but instead he is just equal with Marn and going with that double thorns. But clear level will continue to try and do this invading Nunu. They're potentially falling behind here. They've sacrificed a lot of time in order to try and pull off some of these buff invades. The standard Nunu start with the early side stone and with them pushing the top lane, one of the reasons EDG did it, first of all, they obviously came late into the lane so they couldn't yeah. build up the freeze at first, but it was also to see if they could force SK Telecom to send someone like Wolf up onto the top side and help Marin. That meant there was no dragon pressure for SKT on the bottom side. So Clearlof has been able to ward it up and keep it warded for the entire early game and make sure no early dragons are going down. But now both top laners picking up quite some farm in these uh, lane swaps here. Wolf is down on the bottom side now. Pawn almost finding himself in a three-pronged attack from the mid lane, but it looks like they're going to get a rotation towards the top side here. Mako just on the back side of Daft. Gonna force him out of that. They're still gonna follow with the stun, the flash, oh, and entry. No Marin overheats in the beginning of the fight and adds some good damage to Deft, but they are gonna follow up with a bit of rocket damage here, winning that trade. I almost feel like Mako thought that Deft still had his chompers. That's the only reason you would flash for CC if you thought you could chain it, but instead, he just burns his flash and the rest of the SKT lane walks away and his ignite. Yeah. So that's a thought burn for not that big of a game. Maybe they try and dive him now. No ignite. Push him off the turret at least. Oh, Mako grabbed the aggro. Marin could go down here. Looks like Mako makes it out alive. Bengi is trying to do what he can to keep that aggro on to clear love and in range. And it is not going to be enough. What a caster minion. He is low, but he is not dead until he gets a snowball to the face. Coming in from clear love. Pawn getting towards the top side. Gets himself out alive as he chugs the potion. That dive was so, so beautiful. EDG knew exactly what they were doing. Mako tanked the tower at first, stayed, got the last hit, and then clear up. It's a minion, Under the so he takes yeah. another hit, yeah. and he stays there, and that's enough for Dev to get a second hit in onto Bengi, and then he goes down to clear up. Let's again. see this again here. This is so well played. Yeah. Look how they are tanking the tower and they're keeping full control of it. Mago takes another one before he steps out of the tower. Then you look at Clearlove. He eats a minion, can take another hit. That one hit is enough for Death to hit Bengi another time. And then Clearlove can finish him.
flash snowball at the end. Like you said, Deficio, perfect execution. EDG is the turret diving team. They specialize in that when they're I mean, they're able to get aggressive. <laughs> they have to tower dive. It's such an accelerated game. That's one of the main things that can create conflict and strategy in those ones. Wow, ultimate burn by Marn. So now we can't stop the dive. Mako's Annie is everywhere. Another game where they keep focus on Tamar in the lantern from Wolf. We saw it happening yesterday, and it could really start to thwart EDG's Death game. That's his ultimate. He's going to he try. Get him out. Is he going to try and snipe? He would have been low enough, but he decides not to. Teleport back to the top lane, so Core does not miss any of this. Well calculated there. A full wave to him as it comes in on that siege. And we'll have now Bang backing in the top side. Not much gold. He's going to spend it out and get an Avarice. So EDG making up for that early teleport here. Koro has now been just sitting and farming in the lane while they went up to dive onto Marin. He lost a lot of minions on the tower. Went down for it as well. First Dragon, EDG has kept control on the bottom side and they just kept pushing aggressively on the top. Trying to pull as many members from SKT up there as often as possible. They are playing this early game very, very well. And SK Telecom needs to show they can react now and adapt to what's going on because the early start they were supposed to have with this comp is not there. And the only thing that could have gone better for EDG is if the double kill didn't go over to Nunu. Clear Love won't be able to translate that into the damage. You really want the two carries of this EDG team to grow, but they will grow naturally as long as they can keep this farm even. <laughs> the fact that SK Telecom can now only get their first dragon roughly 16 minutes into the game. That's the whole way that they win the yeah. game is by controlling dragons, especially with this Sivir Lulu synergy. And they are well behind the curve right. for doing so. The only good thing about these early kills for Clear Love is he can go for like Warmog's armor very early, buff that up with the Cinder Hulk, and he has such a high amount of HP that a Lulu and a Sivir simply cannot take him down. Again, Lulu is going to really start falling off in terms of damage because he's obviously using her shield on the AD carry. And we have seen Clearlove get a quarter kill at like, what, <laughs> minute six? Gets four kills on a Nunu. Yeah. But they lost that game. They did, right? <laughs> That's true. But he, he, he was very tanky. Very <laughs> he was super tanky. That's what we're trying to prove here. Yeah, basically. Yeah. All right. Clearlove for kills. He was tanky. tanky. He was there you go. Got it. 2 0 as we start this one. Easy Hood gets the blue transfer over as he now tries to give it to Pawn in the mid lane. Not the blue, but the aggression. They still have Ignites up there, so we could see a little bit of kill pressure. So coming in from Easy Hoon, they can use that wild growth effectively. Marin looks like he finally gets some free time in the top lane, but it won't be for long. He's trying to make up for that 30 CS behind. Bengi's here to help. Let's see how this goes. The equalizer down on Okoro. Clear Love says Peekaboo comes out of the brush. An absolute zero charge up and a knockdown. Where's the four? He's going to lock it up. Get can he get four? the four? Come on, Here it comes. It'll do it. He's tanky enough. Gets popped up. There's the flash, and they may not have the chase. Arcane Smash coming in from Koro. There it is. Oh, he gets the four. Snowball to the back of the head of Bengi. Clear love on a rampage, but specifically because that was a great counter gank right there. Wolf Whoa! Way commits! Holy moly, Wolf flying in once again, trying to mark that territory. Def says, no way, Jose. And Easy Hoon's going pretty hard now. Bang, very low. Easy Hoon, however, takes the zap. Is it oh, enough? no! Oh, Easy Hoon! He throws it himself! Going to be enough, and Mako and Def try to follow this one. They can't serpentine through the minions quick enough. Easy Hoon's safe. Everything's starting to fall apart right here from SKT. All three lanes suffering damage at this point. One of the worst First it starts in the top lane. Second, Easy Hoon's roaming down early, which makes Wolf overcommit for that. They miss all their skill shots. They click on the wrong people. And EDG, with this pressure and aggression, is making SKT make mistakes. And this is really where SKT struggled in the semifinal as well. When they tried to match the early aggression, let's see what happened here. Bengi does stay alive, but in the bottom lane, we saw Easy when he tried to push his wave and then roam down with the Whimsy, as we mentioned with this Lulu. But the engage from Wolf was just way too yeah. early. He walks in pre-level 6 as well, trying That's to land thing. a hook right in front of Death and Mako. And like Thresh, when he winds up the animation here, you have so much time to react, honestly, for EDG and just instantly blow him up. Yeah, he is a Moby Boots Thresh as well, so the Annie can almost one-shot him alone at level 6. The best that comes out of that is they trade one for one, but they end up losing two for zero. And carry clear love with the four kills, but the uh, the rest of the team is pitching in right now too with that bottom lane. It's always one of the annoying things when you play fresh. You feel really tanky in the early game as well, but then you realize you have to pick up these souls here to really start getting some armor. So once you do trade, you're not really that beefy and 
Deft takes a very easy kill from that one. 6-0, first dragon. And SKT, by the way, as we have said, is running a composition that doesn't want to go late game. Right, really work time working against them Whoa. on this. Big Corp force, five bottom people lane. bottom lane. Pawn also over the wall is shifting Zans. It's right on the Koro. They're looking to lock down the bottom lane, though. He almost tried to walk past Bangy. They definitely have their eyes on Bang and on Wolf for that bottom lane. They don't get what they want. They're going to back out. Yeah. Get it in half on the Dragon here. It doesn't look like they can actually get too much out of this now that they've missed out on the opportunity. Mid lane's going to get pushed in here by Easy Hoon. Actually, some breathing room for SKT. Unfortunately, they will lose the buff, and Marin takes that top turret. Basically just a turret trade right there. SKT trying their best to hold off on any real conflict unless they have a big numbers advantage in the fight. They do have a numbers advantage in this fight until Pawn gets here. Here's Easy Hoon. Nice glitter lance to slow down the three members of EDG. Don't have too much vision in this brush though. SKT's blind there. And not go into it with Clear Love having his ultimate up. It's pretty Clear tanky Nunu. Yeah. Pretty tanky. Hey, four kills. Good for you, Clear Love. Good for you. Let's see what he builds in this game. I mean, look at... You get double AP, especially against a Rumble, is fantastic. The earlier you get it, the even better for your team. But yeah. you can also just be greedy and go for their Warmogs and just run around with like 3.5k HP. Look at the enemy they carry and just laugh at him. We also have to remember, again, SKT was up against this against Fnatic all the time, being down in the early game, but still being able to make things happen from 10, 15, 13,000 gold behind. SKT was still in the game. The big difference, though, is Fnatic in those games would run these comps here that really also shine in the mid game. So once we got later on, the gold lead meant less and less because of just the, I the items and the champions you had. Here EDG is running such an insane late game scaling for themselves, having such a big lead. Technically, you should never be able to lose it by now. Right. SK Telecom has yeah. to create some picks, and EDG has to really wow. make a lot of mistakes for that to happen. And as far as creating picks, they don't have Maokai or any real home guard teleport threat. So much of the pressure is put onto Wolf to land a death sentence, but he is extremely far behind once again. At that point, Bengi has to tunnel in to find something. It is really hard for SKT to actually create those opportunities that they need to in order for their composition to succeed. The, rump, the Maokai picks that Koro has taken away from Marin have been so crucial in disrupting SKT's yeah. game strategies. We figured that would be the easy fight that they would get. They'd have a very tanky Mar and be able to go into anything. And right now, they are being pushed into fights that they never want. <laughs> Super Mega Death Rock <laughs> comes in, but it's a 5-0-0 clear love now. Deft on the outside. What a flash to get out of that hook. But he's going to meet Marin as well on the backside. The rest of the team is coming in. Deft is going to live. Marin actually can't go back in the fight. Pawn grabs one towards the bottom side as well. Tell me he's going to kill Marin now. No, it's actually going to go over to Mako. And now Bang's getting chased down by Pawn. The blue buff's only giving him so much mana. And he cannot follow under the turret. Now that EDG has all of SKT down, they're going to get Dragon. Yeah. And with this composition, the second they set foot near a turret, that's going to fall too. Everything is just working for EDG. They had so many wards in the jungle of SKT because they've been so far ahead already that they could see Banky move around. They get a pick onto him first. And what often happens in these games where there's so much action and it's very one-sided, the team who's behind us had to use all these flashes before. So once a big team fight is there, well, obviously they don't, they don't have anything. While we saw Dev just flashing around, he's staying alive. <laughs> Cleared off. He's worth a my friend. full bounty. 500 gold to the killer. Run! But can they kill no. him? Ooh. Going over to Bang there. Definitely much needed. His first kill of the game. And he's sitting yeah. up some scraps right now for rest of the It's also this terrible habit Bang has of going extremely early average blade when he's behind. He needs yeah. immediate combat power because the team is going to force on him. This happened in the Fnatic series as well where he actually built average blade as his first item. This one's a little bit better because he does have the pickaxe and he was able to pick up the 500 gold. Yeah. But it just allows EDG so much more power early game he could have used that Avarice Blade Gold to save up for a BF and have some reasonable power in these mid-game team well, fights. It's when AD Carry basically say, I give up on the early game, I give up on the lane. I just have to look towards two items now where I can start being useful. And that's why they do it. But he's sitting on about 2,000 gold. So that will be the BF sort of at least completed for him. Still not there for the, for the vintage. That's the first pick on Benga though. Yeah, and this is the fight we just saw where EDG picked up so many kills. And a lot of it was just because SKT was behind. Coral still had his summoner spells and chase things down whereas EDG had their summoner spells generally to escape. Then the miracle of the day, Wolf having 
a really unfortunate two games here. Tons of missed Leona things. He misses his play there that could have secured the kill on to Death's Jinx. And then, of course, cleared up the unkillable until a few seconds ago. Was able to close it out with that absolute zero. EDG again starting a fire very early in the game under the feet oh, of SKT. Nice, it's a nice little trap for Marin here. I think they got daft. It looks like they will have him. Do the retribution kills come through? However, Mako takes that aggro way too early, and this starts to backfire. Clear Love just coming back from going down. Looks like he will find the same fate just shortly after. We are going to have Pawn coming up. Actually, Goro coming down from the bottom side of this as well with the Righteous Glory on. Pawn is only steps away now. If they can get that Blood Boil back in this fight, it will be very helpful. And Koro is actually going to use that to take down Wolf. That was a very, very aggressive play from EDG that SK Telecom were ready for Marin, waiting in the bush, getting, getting a bot lane tower as well. So they will get some gold. This 5k difference at the moment in favor of EDG, but at least some kills. And SK Telecom, again, it's one of the ways to get back where you start setting up a few traps, you try and punish EDG if they make a play. Simply, I mean, it's going to be risky. It might also be one way to go for it and simply just end up dying because they are so far behind. But yeah. you need to try. You cannot just sit back and wait. That last one was super clever, though. Marin waiting up there was not what they expected, especially since you'd think SKT would be much more scared about being caught. But they're very knowledgeable about what will happen in the very late game. So they're willing and are taking these necessary risks to try and make things happen. By the way, during the long replay, Pawn did kill Wolf once again. Uh, only accelerating that Azir into the Leecher game. And we can see with this advantage, EDG warding is now on the up and up again. We talked about it a little bit before. They're already starting to pink and ward up Baron. That side of the map looking like a light bright almost for them. And much security needed to make sure SKT can't come back with a big objective fight. Dragon still some time before it comes up. That's not really going to gate EDG for trying to find more aggressive fights. And Marin is doing the same again here, where he delays the Hourglass by going for Abyssal Scepter as the first item, uh, or second item after the Haunting Guys. And what he's basically trying to do is have as much damage as possible, I guess, when you try to snipe the back line, and then also to try and avoid some of the poke coming in from an Azir. The problem is, you still only have that break side the front line. You need that hourglass to be there with him. Clear Love, though. Let's see what he can do. A lot of dedication to this fight now that SKT has used that on the hunt. They have, however, have to use that to get out of this fight as EDG is able to close in way too quick. It's the same again, though. SK Telecom, they keep setting up small traps around the map. This time it was the Baron. EDG, normally, when you're so far ahead, you don't expect the enemy team to sit and wait for you. We'll get surprised Out. a few times. Nobody died this time here. Fill up. He's very tanky. Yeah, it's potentially about EDG waiting on some Dragon Timers, but they've been known to be a little bit impatient, and they have the capability of forcing. SKT staying power in numbers now. We are going to see Wolf back, so they may start to back a little bit themselves. You can see Bang heading towards the bottom side here. A minute on to Dragon. On. Items ahead already. Two items. In the yeah, it's a little bit ahead. A full death cap over <laughs> Easy Hoon. Just a little Lulu. Just a little bit. And there's really nothing to stop him on the side of SK Telecom. Yeah. They need to basically have Pawn sitting on top of an equalizer while they have him in a death sentence. Wolf continually in trouble. Thought he had enough safety at least with oh. Easy Hoon being there. Pawn getting in with the Flash Emperor's Divide to throw Easy Hoon right back into the fray. Double kill for death. And immediate pings onto the Baron after they're able to get those picks. Pawn flashing for the Emperor's Divide, gets him back right there. Basically just using what's got them here and now just zoning out the choke points. If anything tries to steal this, it would be Rek'Sai with the Rumble Ultimate once again. EDG absolutely on a nope. tear here once again coming into Game 3. They have lost no momentum from Game 2 and SKT has not found the way to adapt yet. And they finally got to move around the map and not walk into a trap. Saw that SKT had just positioned normally and then the instant just go down, force a fight on them, get two kills, gives the Baron as well. Bang, it's not going to do a whole lot of damage with the Boomerang. Another Dragon for EDG coming up. SKT is around. There's a flash coming in. Gonna have to take the fight if the fight is right on top of your head. They take down Bengi immediately. 
And that timer that SKT was looking for has pretty much run out for this composition to turn on. EDG on fire here as they grab Dragon number three. 15 kills into this game and a 7,000 gold lead. And EDG, aside from just having that great draft phase, in our opinion, because of the late game scaling, it's the way Clearlove played in the early game. There was that interesting moment when Koro tried to teleport for the blue buff at the start of the game, but if anything, that splits and makes sure Bengi can't snowball any of the lanes. Because if we look at these lanes individually with Rumble, Lulu, and Sivir, they're not doing anything without the assistance of Bengi. So when Clearlove shut him down, the rest of EDG could use their skill to take over. Oh, he flashed on the lantern, but he could not get it because everybody also huddled around the campfire. Bang goes down. Wolf, they're just trying to stop EDG from getting any closer here. Throwing a few deterrents, but EDG is not really worried about anything they're facing at this point. The Wolf Spirit's gonna find them out. They easily are able to take down the blue buff here, and this is where we gotta see EDG start putting their foot down. SKT wants to do they're the same. so tanky. They may find themselves a fight they don't want. Marin overheats right in the middle of it. Vengeful Maelstrom is just completely stopping hardly any damage from hitting Clear Love. Daft in a bad spot, flashed into the pit by himself there, and he's almost staying alive. It is Marin that's going to be able to take him down, but SKT has lost three. Now four yeah. members in the quadra kill for Pond. Bang's the only one that's not there. We keep seeing SK Telecom just trying to get a few picks, a few kills here and there, trying to get back in the game. They know how far behind they are in EDG. Just has so many ways they can play this game out. They have great siege, honestly, to take down Taos with Azir and Jinx. They have a Maokai who can just push down a lane on his own, tailboard in behind for a flank if he wants to. There are multiple ways for EDG to play the, out this game. And at this point, there is just no damage coming out of the SKT team since they've fallen behind. Izuhun doesn't even have his second major item. Bang did just finish his Infinity Edge, but that's at the point that we're seeing 3,000 health on multiple tanks for the EDG side, not to mention the locket for any equalizer damage that would be coming in to hit the team. Everything going in EDG's favor. This fight once again, Daft actually was staying alive here. You can see what SKT is thinking because two guys from EDG is coming back from, from, from the base. So it's only three guys for EDG, but they're still so tanky with the Nunu Maoka, and Def does have good damage already. And once he goes down, well, the next guy just enters with even more damage, honestly, and ends up cleaning house. Clearlove and Koro still staying alive. Koro barely took any damage, just healed most of it up here. So there's simply just no damage coming out of Bang. And also Marin with his build, the fact he can't stay in the front line with Bengi. Okay, even had it been like even in gold or somewhat even here, it would have been very hard for SKT to play these fights unless they get the correct pick onto one of EDG's carries. Bengi getting hit up by most of the team of EDG. It looks like Pawns can be able to stick with him here. Shifting Sands, able to save. Oh, he goes down. A little bit of a burn there. And Pawn able to get some attacks in as well. Great chase, follow-up, and kills coming from EDG. We saw it with SKT's composition coming in, and they knew it as well. They were on a timer, but it seemed like EDG just had that in their mind. They're going much. for Deft once again. He's a little bit out of position. Taking control of that advantage. Whoa, Deft goes down very, very early. Trying to reassess the fight. SKT knows that's all that, all that they can get here. We're gonna have Bengi in just a few seconds. His teleport is up, but he has no way to get to the fight to help his team. Pawn now probably gonna take down Wolf before he can even get onto the stairs of his base. And Clear Love is just 2v1ing, so the rest of the team can still come along with him. He's got the Iron Elixir already on, almost unkillable. And Pawn's able to pick up another one, 8-0-5 on Azir now. They've been able to pick out Defta on a few occasions, but then you can clearly see the rest of EDG coming in for the kill because they just have that massive lead. And what I want to talk about now is whether or not SKT brings in Faker for the next game. Because yeah. the way Pawn has been able to play this Azir and Cassiopeia and banning the other champion, Izuhun's champion pool being stretched here a little bit, maybe they have to play a more accelerated style. And less Izuhun is on Cassio or Azir, he has been unable to dominate these games. And they're going to be one game away from elimination yeah. here. It would remove the LeBlanc ban they've been using. SKT normally ban LeBlanc themselves when they have Isihun in there, and then obviously teams ban it against Faker. Right. Typically, we saw Fnatic leave it open yesterday and try and trade certain other picks for it, but that could be one of the changes you want to make. Try and get a bit of a playmaker in there. Isihun, though, when it comes to playing these standard mages, like Azir and Cassiopeia, 
should be the better pick. So it might not even be the solution. I'm more looking at Maokai and Annie that EDG have been using so well to create these fights and always engage on SK Telecom. But what they seem to be weak against yeah. is this unexpected hard engage that tends to come and they don't know how to react in time unless they've pre-planned the whole thing and they predict where you're going. The Annie for Mako offers this hard engage instantly onto them. He goes for the Talisman as well to buff, his, buff up the team. I think that's one of the things you have to target and remove. If you're even an eye shot of EDG, you're caught. The Talisman of Ascension along with the Righteous Glory is something they go for immediately. Like you're saying with that Maokai and Annie, once again, the Talisman of Ascension burned out there. Righteous Glory, if they oh. even need it to keep on the, the follow. And at Pawn, coming up with another kill as he flashes forward with his soldiers. And they're going to have to get off of that cooker. The red carpet's laid out, but EDG wants none of it. And they're just going to be able to start pushing here. They're fighting in between turrets. And SKT can't really give anything back to him. Easy Hoon gets knocked back by Emperor's Divide. That's going to be Koro picking up a kill. And EDG are now two turrets deep. Diving SKT in their base, 28 to 5, 30 minutes in. EDG doing whatever they want at this point. The D SKT forced to surrender. There was no way they were coming back there. We said SKT had that timer. They knew the composition they chose. We probably won't see that again, but EDG was ruthless about the process and method they took, that, they yeah. took to that game. And just, there seems to be so many different picks for EDG that's so good for them. Like, Hecarim has been banned every single, in, every single game by SKT because Koro is such a fantastic Hecarim player. That gives him the Maokai, though, because it's not a top lane that's getting first picked whenever we see it. Rek'Sai has been now first picked for Benki in this game. He was shut down in the start, and because EDG are lane swapping around and forcing so many fights, Bengi never gets to play the game where he sits and ganks. Yeah, Mako's Annie has been... It's almost like EDG was saving things in the group stage and in the semifinals. I think they were. Because Def's Jinx, Mako's Annie, two of the biggest impact picks in this entire series. Yeah. They had an easy time with AHQ in the semifinals. Their first game against SKT, it seemed like they were just saving everything. We're not going to be seeing Def playing Tristana again at this entire tournament. And they're really putting on a performance in these last two games. To your mention of Faker, they do have five minutes after the Nexus goes down to choose if they wish to use a sub. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of time there, but they also have that time to discuss whether they want to keep Easy Hoon in just because of that pick. Like I said, they knew what they were going in with. We can't really fault SKT. They tried a very tough composition against a very strong EDG. And the interesting thing about this is it's not like Easy Hoon played a poor laning phase right. in game Absolutely. one or two. He did a lot of really impressive things. It's just this game in particular is when they really looked lackluster. But that was yeah. because EDG was all over the map. It's the same thing we've seen other teams do now where SKT fall behind early on. You're constantly forcing fights on them. And that's what's working. So I don't even think it's, again, it's not about the mid lane, for me at least. It's about some of these main picks for EDG they're using to always force the fights. Well, it may not be the mid lane for you. Maybe it is somebody Anastas. And for a look at how Edward Gaming brought this series to match point now, we are going to shoot it over to the guys and Dash. Thank you, Riv. And coming straight to you, Zyrene, we saw Pawn pull out the Azir, proving he can play it just as well as Easy Hoon or Faker. Thoughts on that? This is pretty much my favorite team composition in League of Legends at the moment because you've got multiple sources of persistent damage. You've got so much late game threat, objective control with the Nunu, two tanks, and it overall, it's just absolutely amazing. And the Annie and the Maokai synergy gives you engage power, and then you have disengage with the Azir. You cover almost all your bases, except for things like early game pressure, but the way Clearlove played the Nunu was basically like an early ganker. It was absolutely amazing to watch it. And then Pawn stepping up, he did shake a little bit in the laning phase. Easy Hoon had a really good one, but then things just started to collapse around that mid lane, and I think that's where it got out of hand. Coming to the game, we thought that the Annie would be a really contested pick. And I'm surprised that SKT kind of just let it roll by and ignore how important this pick was. And EDG took it in the first rotation with the Maokai. So the game has evolved, this series in particular, to a point where it, you're not saving picks at all. You're just picking what you know is strong, what's working against the opposing team. SKT now is going to have the red side for the next game, which means that they have the opportunity of either banning it if EDG chooses to pick it, or take the same risk that EDG did and pick it in their first two picks. 
Yeah, it was really strange because SKT, they need to think about their pick ban here because in game two, they first picked Lucian Rek'Sai on the first round. Don't pick that Lucian first. Pick the Annie. It's highly contested in this series, and you can see them right now going over the picks and bans. Faker on the screen. Is he coming in for this one? I think that at this point they should really put in Faker. I mean, Ezion had a really strong performance in game one, um, but I think if it's like to the last series and to the last match and it possibly you can fly out of MSI here. I think you need to put in Faker who is undoubtedly the one that performs the best under pressure. So I hope that they put in Faker and uh, yeah, that he shows why he is considered the god of mid lane. And he I picks mean, the block. <laughs> and he picks <laughs> yeah. the block. Also that. I mean, you, you have, you, it's hard to imagine a world in which Faker does not come in to a best of five series, you know, for uh, a championship title, would, if they are down in that series, it would be the darkest timeline. Yeah, that's the world <laughs> that it would be. <laughs> right, absolutely right. Uh, but I do want to go back to your point about Clear Love in the early game. A lot of people throwing love out to him on Twitter. We have uh, one tweet from at Farm Farm Eight Gaming who said, "Clear Love making SKT tilt. Oh my God, is this real life?" I mean, he was all over the map, as you said, Just throughout tilt this him. game. Just tilt him. Just like Kobe, give SKT some PTSD. I like how he's putting so much pressure this entire game, but he has level one snowball. He's maxing consume, yet he's still going for as many ganks as you would normally if you were maxing it. Oh my god, like Clear Love is just brutal on this. Ooh. I love how he smites the minion too. He's like, no. I'm gonna Gets rid of that extra auto in and there. And honestly, EDG is just so good at baiting engages and doing power dives. Like, they use the pressure and what is a big misconception when you see EDG and AHQ playstyle is that a lot of kills feature uncontrolled games. I think that is not correct. In this um, meta game, when you're going for the tower dives and it's like four versus two, you're totally fine trading one for one if you can get the tower afterwards. And you are forcing the enemy to play your game, react to the tower dives. If they don't do it, they die. And I think this might be the kryptonite towards SKT. Has been confirmed, Faker is coming in for this <laughs> fourth game. Okay, <laughs> so gentlemen, as we look towards that fourth game, what is this change here in both SKT's approach and EDG's reaction to it? It frees up a ban for SKT. They're no longer banning LeBlanc. Now EDG has to ban the LeBlanc. Yep. That's the biggest thing, to be honest. They also have a state. This is what I was thinking throughout the tournament, is that they should play Easy Hoon blue side, and then they should flip play Faker red side, and give Faker the counter pick, and then when they're playing blue side, they get a Cassiopeia and a Zero early for Easy Hoon, and it works out really well for him. But now that Faker gets the counter pick, they can rely on that mid lane, and I think if Bengi gets something that he can get it going with, it could be a game that we see. But this is the thing, is mid lane hasn't been the big problem. It's been the side lanes. It's been Marin in the top lane struggling, being ganked by Clear Love, and also not getting that Maokai for himself, because he had a really good Maokai game, but we haven't seen him get that champion again. And I think that's something that he thrives on, and when he's on the Rumble, he just doesn't have the same team fight impact. And I feel like putting SKT, Faker, the god in the middle, uh, into your game plan, and he's usually the one that, if you're down, is coming into the match. And I think this can affect greatly the mentality. Yeah. If I'm playing with a Faker beside me, who's like radiancing just experience and uh, supremacy, I think that <laughs> you're just playing better. Wow. <laughs> well, I think we can all agree that it's a high stakes match, but these picks have digressed from, you know, in the beginning we thought Thresh was a top pick, even in the, be in the beginning of the tournament, a bard, a super high skill champion. And now we've devolved into the easiest to execute pick, <laughs> a Maokai, a Nunu, the Annie. These are champions that are really hard to mess up on. So these guys are just picking what is safe and what works very well. I want to see more of that style of pick. Stay away from the Thresh, whoever wants to pick it. Go with the Alistar, go with a Janna, just something that is easier to execute, and particularly the Maokai, just because of how good he is right now. Now, we've talked a lot about how putting Faker into the mid lane means, mid lane means that Bangi pays a lot of attention to it. They want to get him rolling. So it actually seems counterintuitive to me, to your point, Zyrene, mm. if the side lanes are the problem, to put the guy in the mid lane who you normally want to focus on and leave the side lanes to fend for themselves. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Faker will get solo kills. Maybe he'll get some attention, then snowball it from there so you don't have to pay attention to that lane anymore. Well, I want to work on that point as well, though. In the first game, Pawn showed a lot of vulnerability to the early pressure, particularly the Gragas gank work, which should not have, and then eventually a big lead was built up in that mid lane. I think that's what they're going for with bringing in Faker for this time around. A little bit more pressure means that Faker can snowball hard enough to shut down Pawn. And maybe he's also the one starting the rotations because what I think is SKT is a little bit 
resting on the laning phase for too long when they should really be roaming out. And I think SKT, when they have a mid lane pressure from Faker like this, he can easily roam together with Bengi into the enemy jungle, putting the walls down and denying the tower dives, which are so eminent if you play against EDG. And they just strive on those tower dive pressure for pressure play. So if you can actually shut that down with early, early wards, and then play your game, I think SKT can come back here. And that's the thing is the side lanes have been suffering, but like you said, if Faker is gonna start roaming, which Ezihun doesn't do a whole lot of roaming, right? He prioritizes CS above everything else. That could be what opens up the map for them if Bengi and Faker make a roaming squad. Lastly, we've talked a lot about EDG accelerating the pace of the game here after game one, really forcing SKT to play on their pace, on their style. How does SKT get back to that more consistent, stabilized gameplay that is around rotations and objectives and farming up and picking the correct fights. I think you just boil it down to the pick. The composition that you have dictates how you want to play the game. You know, some comps are better at sieging, some are better at team fighting. And one of the best comps I saw from SKT this tournament was the first game against Fnatic, that Ezreal mid lane. A really high skill for Faker so that he can now play the mid lane or get a big advantage there help the side lanes out with the true shot barrage. We've seen him actually, he's so good that he helps his other lanes without even moving. I wanna see that kind of composition from them. They do have the last pick. It's a little bit of a telltale if we see an early Corky pick from SKT, but I think that's their best shot. All right, well, a lot to mull over there. We're going to step away while the teams craft their strategies for game four. But first, we want to check in on another Coca-Cola viewing party. Don't worry, Seth King, I got you covered on this one. This one is taking place in San Francisco. Ooh, Achilles cast. I know that guy. You do know yeah, him? Yeah, he's the caster that works in the amateur scene. All right, well, there really you have really it. Nice guy. Hit me up. Wanted some love from San Francisco. They're going plenty crazy, <laughs> so they deserve it. Well, keep it tuned right here. The Midseason Invitational continues with game four between Edward Gaines Gaming and SKT in just three and a half. Last game, Edward Gaming was able to come out on top. Now's the chance for SKT to kind of bounce back. Gets popped up, there's the flash, and they may not have the chase. Arcane Smash coming in from Koro. Double. There it is! Oh, he gets the fourth one! But it's a 5-0-0 clear up now. Deft on the outside, what a flash to get out of that hook, but he's gonna meet Marin as well on the backside. Deft in a bad spot, flashed into the pit by himself there, and he's almost staying alive. It is Marin that's gonna be able to take him down. Easy Hoon gets knocked back by Emperor's Divide. That's gonna be Koro picking up a kill, and EDG are now two turrets deep. SKT forced to surrender. There was no way they were coming back there. 